so uh, just a couple of things to get us started here. First, um, the readings for Wednesday. We're going to be looking at the excerpts by Edmund Burke and Mary Wollstonecraft in the French Revolution section. Right? It's also a good idea if you read the brief editor's introduction to the Revolution controversy, because that'll give you uh, a good sense of the context in which Burke and Wollstonecraft are writing. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the response papers, uh, since those are the first of those is going to be due on Friday. So let me just uh, give you the assignment sheet for that. I will also post this on Georgia View in case you guys lose the overall assignment. So here's what I want from the response papers, right? The overall purpose of these, right, the reason that I have you doing them is because they'll give you good practice for the essay exam questions. Um, they'll help you generate material you can use for the longer papers. And they will also give you a lot of practice close reading the language of the course text and putting them into a, a proper historical context, right? And that's the big thing that I want you doing in these papers. I want you doing a good close reading. We'll define what that means in a moment and contextualizing what it is that you are reading. So the basic guidelines here for this, they are to be 500 to 750 words. Right? I want no fewer than 500 words, no more than 750 words. If you can't make, if you can't make it to 500, you're, not, you're, you're dealing with something that's too small. If you go over 750, you're biting off more than you can chew, right? So try to keep it in that range there. Um, Times New Roman font, 12-point type, double-spaced. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't mean to be a stickler about this sort of thing. It just makes it a lot easier for me to read, especially on a screen. Um, also, you are not to use secondary sources for these response papers, right? I just want to see your ideas on paper, right? So, you know, nothing from the web, nothing from the library, nothing in, nothing beyond your own ideas, your own interpretation of the quote in these response papers. Okay, so, um, citations and MLA formats. And what you're going to do is choose a single short quote, no shorter than a sentence, no longer than a, than a short paragraph from the assigned text to analyze. So it can be any of the texts that we've read in that given week. So for this week, you can choose one of the Gothic texts, or you can write about Burke or Wollstonecraft, right? Those are the texts for this week. You're gonna put the quote at the top of the page before you start writing, and this does not count towards your 500 word minimum, right? Because that's something you have to put in. So don't choose an enormous chunk of quote just to try to make the word count, right? Um, okay, does anybody have any questions so far? Just about the basic idea and about formatting and stuff like that. All pretty simple thus far, right? So when you are choosing your quote, I want you to think about the following, right? Pick a quote that you think points to some larger theme or issue in the text, right? So something that you can, you know, hook on to some bigger idea, right? Um, or, you know, if, even if it's not a bigger theme in the text, maybe a bigger theme in the course, right? It's a good idea if you pick something you can connect back to things that we've talked about in class. You also probably want to look for quotes that raise questions that you can try to answer in your paper, right? So instead of picking a quote that you understand perfectly in its literal sense, it's often a good idea to pick something that's a little ambiguous that you need to work out for yourself, right? Because then you'll work harder at trying to answer those questions that the text raises. So once you've selected a quote, I want you, before you start writing, to try to perform a close reading on the quote. Then, once you are ready to write, you're probably going to want to introduce your paper by putting this quote in a particular historical context, right? So does, ever, does anybody know what I mean by close reading? 
Is anybody familiar with this term? Okay. You've probably already been doing this, particularly in your English classes. You just might not have a name for it yet. So when we close read, what we're doing is reading a text with minute attention to language, form, and detail. Right? We're making meaning out of small details within a text and the way they're connected to each other. So it's something you do before you start writing in order to help you generate an interpretation. So I've got steps laid out for you here, right? The first thing you want to do is pay close attention to particular words and sentences, right? So you want to pay attention not just to the literal, but also to the implied meanings of words, right? So not just what a word means, but also the things that it suggests, right? So um, I'll use the example I use with you guys that, uh, that, I'll use with you guys the example I often use in my composition classes. So we know, literally what a rose is, right? What is a rose? Flower. Yeah, it's a, a flower, usually red, uh, grows on a bush, uh, has thorns, right? Related to certain kinds of trees. Um, but what ideas do we associate with the rose? Romance. Yeah, romance, beauty, sexuality, but also potentially danger and pain, right? Right, all of these things mixed in with the possibility of danger, the possibility of pain because of those thorns, right? So what I want you to do is, you know, when you come up with a word that has like a range of associations like this, right? I want you to think about that range of associations and how you might read that into what the text is doing, right? Why use a word in this case that has this range of associations? You also want to be aware of the multiple, possible multiple meanings of specific words, right? Are there places where the author is playing on ambiguity and double meanings? And just look for any potentially meaningful images and symbols. You're also, once you find these kind of individual words, symbols, and whatnot, you're going to want to look for patterns and connections between them, right? So look for words, images, or ideas that repeat throughout the text. If it repeats, it's probably important, right? Look for lines or words, especially in poetry, that are connected through rhyme or through alliteration. Examine the sequence of plot elements if we're reading something in prose, right? Does it unfold in a kind of straightforward, linear manner? Or is the plot kind of chopped up? in a strange way. And look at things that, that help to establish a, a relationship between the narrator, the speaker, and the reader or the hearer, right? What is the relationship the narrator the speaker sets up with you? Are they speaking to you, or do they seem to be speaking to some other listener, right? And finally, what you want to do is try to put that pattern together, right? So, you want to think about how the details you've noticed so far add up to a single theme. All right, preferably one of the bigger themes that we're going to be talking about in the course. Any ambiguous words, try to resolve their meanings, right? especially in poetry. Think about the potentially contradictory ideas the text holds in tension with one another. And think about how the way the text is put together helps us to make meaning out of it. Right? How are all of these parts related? And what do these relationships between the parts mean? So I realize like this is kind of a lot, right? And it takes practice. Does anybody have any questions about this right now? Okay, I want to note too, right? Again, like this is basic stuff you should be doing kind of pre-writing, right? As you're figuring out what it is you want to do and what you want to say. The second thing you want to do is place the text in its proper historical context, right? So <laughs> I've got a list of questions here to help you do that. And I just want to note here, I've got it on the assignment sheet, but I want to just double note that 
I am instituting a blanket ban on the phrase back in the day. Now, can anybody guess why I hate the phrase back in the day? Exactly, because it's really, really vague, right? It's assuming that all history is just this kind of jumble of stuff that happened before you were born, and that the sequence of events doesn't really matter, that specific historical contexts don't really matter, right? And what I want you doing is paying attention here to specific contexts and specific historical moments. Um, so if we just kind of like change the way we talk about the past, right? If we don't use phrases like back in the day, it helps us to be more specific in our writing and our thinking, right? Okay. So you want to think about how the text incorporates or responds to specific historical events. You also want, we're going to be talking a lot about intellectual history in this class, so you're also going to want to think about which specific historical trends and literary, philosophical, or cultural influences inform the text. You want to think about the stance the text seems to adopt towards its historical moment, right? Does it seem typical of a text in this period? Does it seem to reflect mainstream opinion? Or does it seem to be pushing against the mainstream in some way? We're also going to talk a lot about what's called reception history, right? So, you know, how audiences receive particular texts. You might want to try to take that into account. You want to think about form and circumstances of publication and whether you can connect this to other texts that we've read in the course, right? So one thing that is going to help you a lot in your response papers, particularly when it comes time to write the exams and the final paper, is being able to connect texts that we read to each other, right? Look for texts that share common ideas, common themes. And start doing that in your response papers. Okay, so again, like this is all stuff you do to set up what you're going to write, right? But remember that what you are writing here is an essay, not a response to a series of questions. So answering the questions will help you come up to, with material, but then you have to arrange it into a 500 word essay, right? Put it into essay form. You may come up with more material than you need. That's fine. Just choose what's most relevant, right? And focus on that. And then you can save the extra stuff for one of the longer papers or for the exam, right? Okay, so does anybody have any questions about these reflection papers? Yeah, Danielle. Never mind. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, the due dates are all listed on the syllabus. And in general, assume one of these is due every Friday unless I tell you otherwise. Did they fix that problem on Georgia? Pardon? You remember how last semester it was saying it was due the next day because it was midnight? Did they fix that? Yeah, yeah, I'm able now to set it up so that it is, so it will show the, the, the less confusing date, right? Yeah, so I, I've got it set up now so that everything is due at 11.59 which is the last minute of any given day, right? So um, what's, what's Friday's date? What, is, what the hell is today's date? Uh, Friday <laughs> today is the 29th. Today's the 25th, Friday's the 29th. Okay, so yeah, so the calendar in Georgia View will show the 29th, right? But because Georgia View is unreliable and wonky, again, just always assume that it's due on Friday, whatever the Georgia View calendar says, right? Yep, you'll, yep, just click on, click on the, the assessments tab, click on assignments, and th th yeah, there will be an open link. And you just upload it to that. Yes? Can we only reference the, um, okay, so the quote's going to come from one of the texts. Can we only reference that text, or can we reference another text that relates to it? I would say for now, since we're only looking at, you know, a couple of texts for this week, um, I would say maybe try to focus on just one for now. And you should always keep your main focus on just one, right? But as we accumulate knowledge over the course of the term, then you know, go back to previous things. Other questions? Yes, Aaron. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing like paragraph form or just 
Uh, double space is kind of. Yeah, I am going to want, yes, I am going to want paragraphs, right? Now, I don't want like a five paragraph form essay, or I don't like a, I want like a specific number of paragraphs. What I do want you to do is to start a new paragraph every time you move on to a different idea, right? Think of paragraphs as signposts for your reader. When you start a new paragraph, you are showing the reader that you're moving on to something else. So usually, you know, because you know, 500 words ends up being, 500 to 750 words ends up being like a page and a half to two pages, you'll usually end up with three or four paragraphs. Yes, Serenity? Um, did you want like a work site change, or did you just want us to cite how we did the conference? Yeah, I do want a works cited page in addition to a parenthetical citation when you quote at the top of the page. And it's mostly just to get you in the habit of doing it. So you always get in the habit of citing. You're only going to be citing one text, right? You're going to be citing just the thing that you are um, quoting from. And the way I want you guys to cite it, right? Don't just cite the whole anthology. Cite that specific text, right? So if you're say if you're writing about Edmund Burke, right? Then you know what you want is you know you want to start the citation with you know Burke. Edmund excerpt from Reflections on the Revolution in France then the title of the anthology Who the hell edited this? Right. Stephen Greenblatt, editor. New York, Norton. And then the page numbers for the uh, excerpt. So if you were using Edmund Burke, right, for as your writing sample, this is how you would cite it. Okay, any other questions? So I also have here for you uh, a bibliography which cites the sources that I use putting uh, today's lectures together. Before we start talking about the Gothic, um, I want to talk a little bit about the way traditionally English literary history has been taught and understood, which is actually kind of, which is actually relevant to our discussion of the Gothic, right? So what we tend to do is break literary history up into discrete periods. that are often kind of like very loosely based around um, the uh, dates of the accession and death of particular kings and queens, right? So the period we're concerned with uh, from the 18th century up to the present would usually be divided up into six distinct periods. 
right? The first, which is kind of pre what we're talking about, but it's still kind of important for understanding a lot of what we're doing, is the Augustan period. from about 1700 to 1750, which is followed by the age of sensibility from about 1750 to 1789. The Romantic period from 1789 up until 1837. And we're kind of noticing here, right, that most of these periods are about um, 35 to 50 years long, right? So, you know, they're kind of like roughly about the span of two generations. Then the Victorian period is from 1837 to 1901, right, an almost, you know, a very, very long span of time. What we call the modern period, from 1901 to about 1939, and the postmodern period, so-called largely because we just don't have a better name for it, from 1939 to hmm, whatever. Um, so, there are a couple of issues with this particular schema. Um, one is that each period is defined in terms of a kind of dominant literary practice or sensibility, right? So, for example, the Augustan period is regarded as being dominated by what's called the neoclassical style, right? So neoclassicism values reason, balance, and harmony, and neoclassical literature tends to be very rigidly structured. Poetry and drama in particular were written almost entirely in iambic pentameter and in what are called heroic couplets, right? That is like basically, you know, every, uh, like, every line in the poem, every line in the play, are like they're paired rhymes, right? Going all the way down. Um, and they're primarily concerned in this period with making general points about overall human nature. So this is the period that immediately proceeds where we're, uh, proceeds where we're starting in this course, right? Now, the age of sensibility that follows it is where we see the rise of what's called the novel of sentiments. And the basic goal of literature of sensibility is to make the reader feel the protagonist's emotional struggles. So when we talk about sensibility, Sensibility literally means um, receptiveness to sensory and emotional inputs of various kinds. While sentiment refers to a preference for feeling over thinking. 
the age of sensibility tends to be regarded as a kind of transitional period between the Augustan period and the Romantic period, um, which we'll discuss in more detail um, as we get closer to it uh, in history. However, um, the reason I lay all this out here is actually to make a point about this particular means of doing literary history, right? Can we see anything that might be problematic about laying out literary history in terms of distinct periods, each with a particular defined attitude or sensibility? Yeah, Danielle. It's limiting. It is extremely limited, right? Yeah, so what would tend to happen then to any work that doesn't fit the dominant sensibility of the time? It's yeah, it gets it gets forgotten and ignored, right? Good. What were you going to say, Nick? Oh, I just uh, uh, said things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. The other problem is that a lot of these dates are subject to dispute, right? So, for example, when the age of sensibility ends and when the Romantic period begins. Uh, is something that a lot of people argue about. Like, I prefer the date 1789 because I think the French Revolution is a big kind of catalyst point for uh, Romanticism. Other scholars prefer 1798, which is when the first major British Romantic work, Wordsworth and Coleridge's Lyrical Ballads, is published. Same thing goes for, you know, so the, you know, where the modern period ends and the postmodern period begins, and how these two things are different from each other. Um, there's a lot of confusion regarding that. And if we look at just how bloody long the Victorian period is as, as well, right? There are several kind of sub movements going on in the Victorian period that don't get accounted for by simply calling literature of the mid to late 19th century Victorian. So what I want to focus this class on is these kinds of sub-movements um, and these kind of subsidiary narratives that are running through all of these periods. And the Gothic is a good example of one of those uh, kind of sub-genres that doesn't quite fit easily into the period in which it first appears, right? So it's a product of the, the so-called age of sensibility, but it's not very similar to the dominant literary forms of that time, or at least what were considered the dominant literary forms of that time. The Gothic was probably the most popular literary form in its period. But it's only relatively recently that scholars have started taking it all that seriously. So um, I also just want to quickly say um, that generally before class, I'm going to be playing a piece of music that is in some way relevant to uh, what we're going to be talking about that day. So today I chose um, one of the final <coughs> uh, passages in uh, Mozart's Don Giovanni. Uh, are any of you familiar with Don Giovanni or with the story the opera tells or... I'm um, going to assume that those blank looks mean no. Okay, right. So Don Giovanni is about um, a young aristocrat uh, who is, like, kind of lives a life of like, unbridled pleasure seeking, right? Uh, he, tries to, you know, he tries to seduce as many women as he can. You know, he drinks, he feasts, he just you know, enjoys himself. Um, and indulges him, like indulges all of his whims and desires, right? Now, early in the opera, he is trying to seduce a young woman, gets caught by her father, and kills the father. And then at the end of the opera, the father's ghost returns to drag him down to hell to pay for his sins. Now, the reason I chose this is because this is actually a pretty good example of a Gothic theme. And it demonstrates the Gothic is not a purely English literary phenomenon either, right? There are these kinds of you know, horror tales spreading across Europe in the latter half of the 18th century. <clears throat> 
So let me just try to get a sense from you what you thought of these readings. How did this? How did these go for you? What did you think of the Gothic? I was kind of sad that it didn't give me more to read. It just kind of, it cut off the uh -huh. cliffhanger. Just yeah, off. and yeah, I mean, yeah. The only thing that you have as a whole here, or the only Gothic text you have as a whole, is Sir Bertrand, which is a fragment, right? There is no more of Sir Bertrand than that. It was written as a fragment. Um, but yeah, otherwise, you know, just given that the, the anthology is just trying to give you a general overview of what the genre looks like, right? Uh, yeah, we have excerpts from a couple of different novels. Okay, yeah, morbid. Now, what do you mean by morbid? What struck you as morbid about these? And any, anybody can respond. Most of the settings. What's that? The settings. Okay, and what about the settings? Tell me, tell me a little about the settings. Well, like in a lot of these, um, the authors they sort of put an emphasis on like the space around the character, so you can envision it. It's just kind of scary. Yeah. Yeah, most, most Gothic writers use space and landscape as one of their tools to induce horror, right? So you have things like um, secret passages, right? hidden dungeons, right? mazes. And one of the sources of horror that is most common in the Gothic is a sense of spatial disorientation. Right, finding yourself someplace and not knowing how to get back, right? Now, <clears throat> these are the kinds of internal spaces we see in the Gothic, right? But in terms of landscapes, uh, we often see um, gloomy and dramatic landscapes, right? Mountains. Lonely moors. Dark forests. Things of that nature. What else did you guys notice about this? What else seemed morbid about these? Or what else seemed significant about these? Yeah, go ahead. The passions themselves were very morbid. Okay, give me an example. Well, um, the, I can't remember the names of it, but the, the, the monk, he was seduced by um, the demon in disguise. Uh-huh. It was a lustful passion that drove him to you know, casting aside his beliefs. Uh-huh. And he was going to break a girl. Like, that's mm -hmm. a, a very morbid passion in the long run. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, we have people in kind of excessive emotional states, right? We can compare this also uh, to Manfred and Isabella in the excerpt from the Castle of Toronto, right? You know, Manfred is insistent that his line is going to continue, even though his sickly little son has been crushed by this giant helmet that fell out of nowhere. Straight up divorces um, his wife. <laughs> yeah, just just by, by decree says, you know, you know, Hippolyta is no longer my wife. You know, Isabella, I Manfred will be your husband. Um, so his overweening ambition and anxieties over continuing his dynasty, right? would fall into this, as would, as would Isabella's terror in running away from this lunatic, right? So yeah, we are frequently dealing with characters who are in excessive emotional states, right? What else did we notice as a common thread that seems to run through much of these? Yeah? I'm kind of getting back to of what she said. Um, uh-huh. When talking about the excessive emotional states, I also feel like that has to do with their morals and, you know, sort of makes us question all. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, these, these texts do raise serious moral questions and moral issues. 
about the extent to which it is acceptable to pursue your personal goals in particular, right? And also about like, the use of power. There's a good deal in the Gothic about the responsible and irresponsible use of power. And I think when we talk about power, it's probably a good idea here to talk about one of the distinctions that's made within the subgenre of the Gothic, right? There are two basic subgenres that we call uh, male and female Gothic. So the male Gothic centers on an overreacher character who tries to step beyond the normal bounds of propriety. Right? Someone who has no patience with the limits society has placed on him and decides to do something dramatic to break those bonds, right? So a character like Ambrosio in The Monk, right? He sells his soul to the devil in order to get magical powers to satisfy the lusts that his religious vows have denied to him, right? Now the female Gothic is quite different um, in that it centers on a character that typically has little power. Right, so in the female Gothic, we have a young woman whose life or virginity is threatened by an older man. Indeed. Yeah, there, there were Harvey Weinsteins running around in the 18th century, too. And pretty much unchecked by the legal system. We'll get into more of that kind of talk when we read Virginia Woolf later in the semester. Um, and A Room of One's Own. Um, but yeah, so um, these are the basic models, right? Now, there are two other kind of subdivisions that um, <clears throat> we find in the Gothic. There's a different, they don't map quite clearly onto male Gothic and female Gothic, but they sort of overlap. Uh, there's the novel of horror and the novel of terror. So in the novel of horror, the supernatural occurrences are real. And the main character usually comes to a bad end. They're usually done in by their particular vices. Now, the novel of terror, I like to call the Scooby-Doo Gothic. How many of you are familiar with Scooby-Doo? Okay, just about everybody, right? Yeah, it's been around since the 60s, but everybody knows it, yeah? So, what usually happens at the end of an episode of Scooby-Doo? They get on the mask. Yeah, they catch the villain, right? They catch whoever the ghost or werewolf or vampire is, right? And they say, yep, now let's see who you really are. And they pull it off, and it's Old Man Withers, the guy who runs the haunted amusement park, right? And he would have gotten away with it, too, if it weren't for you meddling kids. That's the way terror gothic usually works, right? All of the supernatural occurrences have a rational explanation. Right? What the young heroine thought was a ghost was just a, a white sheet that somebody left hanging 
um, in a bedroom, right? You know, the, uh, the noises of chains and clanking at night uh, were faked by someone who's trying to hide a treasure, things like that, right? Yeah, go ahead. So it's hard to tell without having the whole story uh -huh. with um, Isabella and um, the, the crazed dad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Manfred, yep. The, the picture on the wall uh -huh. came out from the frame and like side. Would that be an example of those? Yeah, in the Castle of a Toronto and the Monk of the text that you read for today, I guess also Sir Bertrand, but you know, that's a fragment of the text, right? Those would all fall into loosely the horror category because the supernatural occurrences are real or are to be taken as real. Walpole is not a particularly skillful prose writer, so the ones in the Castle of a Toronto come off kind of stilted. Uh, the ones in The Monk actually tend to come off a lot better uh, because Lewis is a better prose stylist um, and is better at building a convincing narrative than Walpole is. He just seems to be trying to cram as many incidents in as possible. Um, but I digress. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, those would be in that horror category. Um, the Anne Radcliffe excerpts would be in the terror category. And yeah, the other thing that we know about the novel of terror, right, is that the tension created by fear in these is always resolved. Right? You get that happy ending where you unmask the villain and the young hero marries the young heroine and everybody lives happily ever after now, right? So this horrific episode in this young woman's life is now over and she can live normally, right? Yeah, go ahead. Does that mean that Disney movies are kind of like the Disney movies are kind of like the Hollywood movies in that they're like um not necessarily because these kinds of marriage plots are pretty common historically sort of like going back to the ancient world, right? I mean, you know, Shakespeare plays often, you know, like Shakespeare's comedies, for example, often end with a, end with a marriage. Uh, Greek comedies often end with a marriage or reconciliation of some sort, right? So I think what's going on in these terror novels is they are relying on this kind of traditional ending to break the tension created by the terror devices they've been using throughout, right? Uh, it, was all just, it was all just your wicked uncle all along making these noises, and now everything's all right. So the audience, well, let me, let me talk a little bit about sort of where this craze for the Gothic came from, right? So you probably noticed, in addition to the kind of spatial settings here, temporally, the settings tend to be medieval, right? Or kind of faux medieval. Right. They're based on a particular idea of the Middle Ages, and they take place in these castles and abbeys and you know old manor houses, right? And they're usually set in continental Europe rather than in England. They're in France, they're in Italy, they're in Spain, right? Rarely do you have a Gothic romance that is set in England proper? And part of that is because the Gothic, the Gothic is actually kind of anti-Catholic in a lot of its sensibilities. I mean, hell, like, you know, one of the excerpts you read was about a wicked monk, right, who uses the disguise afforded him by his profession to go out and seduce young women using magic, right? So this is a pretty dominant strain in British cultural life in the 18th and 19th centuries, in part because Catholics were regarded as disloyal to the crown. Right? What do we know about the Church of England, if anything? Yeah. Founded by Henry VIII, and it becomes 
a strong part of British national identity, right? So you know, Britain identifies itself as a Protestant country, while most of its geopolitical rivals from the Renaissance onward, France, Spain, Austria, are predominantly Catholic. So Protestantism becomes part of British national identity, right? This is how we are different from these other nations that oppose us and oppose our interests. And we can even see in the monk, if we look at the passages in which Ambrosio is admiring the painting of the Virgin Mary. Can we turn to page 529, please? Can I get somebody to read the passage that starts with, as he said this, he fixed his eyes upon a picture? Excuse me. Upon a picture of the Virgin, which was suspended opposite to him, this for two years has been the object of his increasing wonder and adoration. He paused and blazed upon it with delight. What beauty in that countenance. He continued after a silence of some minutes. How graceful is the turn of the head, of that head. What sweetness, yet what majesty in her divine eyes. How softly her cheek reclines upon her hand. Can the rose vie with the blush of that cheek? Can the lily rival the whiteness of that hand? Oh, if such a creature existed, and existed but for me. For I permitted to twine round my fingers those golden ringlets, and press with my lips the treasures of the snowy bosom. Gracious God, should I then resist the temptation? Should I not barter for a single embrace the reward of my Embrace the reward and resist the temptation. Should I not barter the single embrace? The reward of my sufferings for 30 years. Should I not? Okay, uh, you can stop there. Thanks. Right. Yeah, this, this, is, uh, this is where the, the meat of what I wanted to look at here was. Now, does this sound like somebody in a, uh, like in a moment of religious ecstasy or devotion? What's his response to this picture of the Virgin Mary? Yeah, the picture makes him horny, right? So the, what, what the novel is doing here, right, it's kind of like demonstrating how particular features of Catholicism, right, including the adoration of female saints and a cloistered monastic life, lead one to sinful habits, right? So it's making a direct connection between Ambrosio's Catholicism and his primary sin, right, his lustfulness. Now, he's also, as we see, you know, he also suffers from overweening pride, as we would have noticed uh, if we read the excerpt. Uh, but yeah, so this, this anti-Catholicism is pervasive in British culture in this period, right? And it's a central part of what's going on in Gothic novels. Now, the other fixation has more to do with the settings and with all of these weird physical spaces that we see in the Gothic. Um, there is at the same time so you know latter half of the 18th century an antiquarian craze in England. Now what this means is that there is a fashion, a kind of fad, for medieval architecture, for medieval ornaments, right? You know, people start filling their houses with suits of armor and tapestries and things like that. They start putting stained glass windows in their houses, like anything to make it look more medieval. Now, it's based on 
a kind of back in the day idea of history where you know the Middle Ages are this kind of one jumbled period where there's no real distinction uh, you know between centuries between years between cultures right so it's a wrong-headed idea of the Middle Ages but it becomes incredibly pervasive and incredibly popular let me show you uh, some of what this looked like at Horace Walpole's um, own house at Strawberry Hill in the London suburb of Twickenham. So Walpole was the younger son of Robert Walpole, the British Prime Minister. And he was, he was rich and had little else to do with his money, right? Although I guess you know he probably could have you know spent it on you know charitable charitable enterprises things like that right but no instead he decided to build himself a kind of fairy tale castle at Strawberry Hill which becomes kind of like the model Gothic dwelling so this is the outside of Strawberry Hill and the rooms inside are also done in a faux medieval tower. So you see we've got, these, we've got these towers, we've got these crenellated battlements, right? All of these pseudo medieval features built onto the house. Rose windows, right? This part of the house looks almost like, a like an idealized version of a medieval abbey, right? So this is what the library looks like. And these fashions extended out into the grounds of the house as well. Right, so there was a fashion for constructing what became known as Gothic Follies on the grounds of aristocratic estates, right? So these are buildings that are meant to look old but they're really just like little kind of, um, they're the equivalent of garden gnomes, right? They're just ornamentation, expensive ornamentation. So, you know, here we have, you know, what looks like an old ruined Roman temple, right? This isn't that old. It was built in the 1780s, I mean, which is old by our standards, but not, you know, old by Roman temple standards. And no Roman deity was ever actually worshipped here, right? It's just a decoration in some rich guy's garden. Right? Same with this, right? This is a, a faux medieval chapel that someone went ahead and built in the garden. And sometimes they went for a more internationalist flavor. So, you know, one enterprising 18th century individual went and built um, a Chinese pagoda that stretches up into the sky in his garden. So there's, the, you know, this extended even to people building little fake hermitages on their property and paying people to live as holy hermits on their property to give it a more authentic medieval feeling, right? So at least, you know, in terms of the culture of wealth and privilege, um, the Gothic stems out of um, a kind of passion for bullshit, right? Expensive, showy um, displays of wealth, particularly in pursuit of the antique and the exotic. Now, that said, the primary audience for Gothic novels was not the wealthy. Can anybody guess who these novels might have been aimed at based on what you read? Who do you think was reading these? Women. Yeah, predominantly women. And of what relative social class do you think? Well, I thought middle class kind of. Yeah, yeah, M middle class women predominantly, right? Yeah. 
because right, printing methods becoming less expensive um, and you know the ma a mass press coming into existence, literacy rates had increased dramatically in the 18th century. So there was a real appetite for print, right? People wanted things to read. Um, the other thing that a lot of these Gothic presses, the, Gothic, the publishers of Gothic novels did, was they made it so that you didn't have to buy the book. And indeed, that you could just kind of cycle it out for a new one every so often, right? You, fin you, you finish um, Anne Radcliffe's latest novel, you can um, you know, turn it back in and get something else, right? So publishers ran these circulating libraries. Now these didn't work quite like, you know, say like the Lake Blackshire Public Library over there on Lamar Street, right? Our modern public library is free, right? Or at least it's you know subsidized by taxpayer funds. You can go get a library card for free and take out any book you want for a certain period of time without paying any money, right? These circulating libraries were private enterprises. They were owned by publishers who were often seeking to build a kind of brand loyalty, right? So, you know, if you subscribe to the Minerva Press's circulating library, then, you know, you'll just keep reading more and more Minerva Press books, right? And it'll build up, you know, the sense of loyalty to that particular press. Um, and yeah, the primary subscribers Right, you paid a subscription fee. More middle class women. Now this accounts for some of the Gothic's dodgy scholarly reputation. Um, one thing that we have to remember is that historically, most scholars of literature and history have been white men of the upper and upper middle classes, right? So if we look at that kind of period scheme that we were looking at, a lot of what is regarded as important literature in any given period is shaped by the tastes of the people who made that canon up, right? As more women and working class people and people of color have been coming into the academy, that's opened up our ideas of what literature was in any given period. And a lot of um, genres like the Gothic that had been kind of left behind and forgotten have been rediscovered and have been reevaluated. Now it is true that some Gothic novels are shit, right? Some of them are formulaic crap. But others are actually really clever and inventive in a lot of ways. Um, several of Anne Radcliffe's novels, uh, for example, The Mysteries of Udolpho is worth the read, especially like, I know one of you said in your little info sheet you like Stephen King. So yeah, read, read The Monk, read The Mysteries of Udolpho, you'll probably dig it. Um, but <clears throat> even in its own time, the Gothic was controversial because it was regarded by a lot of mainstream scholars and critics as a kind of moral hazard. So you would see in, public, in a lot of uh, magazines at the time, Cartoons like this one, right? So the label here, you know, the, the, the caption here is luxury. And we see a young woman in a state of half undress standing in front of a fire, right? She's got her bare backside to the fire. Um, she's got her hands in the front of her dress, um, which is meant to indicate sexual excitement. And you can't see it here, but she's, the, the book that she's got open is a copy of The Monk. So, what the cartoonist here was trying to demonstrate was that the Gothic was morally hazardous, especially for the young women who were reading it, right? Because it would put them into a state of intense emotional excitement um, that, that they would then need to release in ways that were um, socially untoward, right? And this is some of the argument that um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge makes 
against the Gothic, right? That it is morally noxious. So basically, Gothic equals erotic overload. Yeah, even though, like, there, there's very little directly erotic content in the Gothic, and even like when there is direct sexual content, and there is. It's usually not particularly sexy, right? It's usually um, in the context, uh, like we saw with Ambrosio uh, sneaking into Antonia's chambers, it's usually in the context of some kind of assault. But <clears throat> what... So I think that a lot of these critics of the Gothic probably didn't really fully appreciate or understand much of what was going on in it. Right, they saw what they saw, like a bunch of kind of like sickly, terror-driven ghost stories that often resolved in these kinds of formulaic ways. Never mind, again, that like these were incredibly popular. Right. Anne Radcliffe was the best-selling author in England, the highest paid author as well, of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And many of the, particularly the second generation of romantic poets, we'll be looking at in a couple of weeks, acknowledged her influence. Now, you know, she wrote these flowery descriptions of these European vistas without ever having left England in her life, right? So it's all out of her imagination. Um, but I think it's uh, worth noting as well. What was I, what the hell was I going to say? I was talking about the idea of the Gothic as moral hazard. Libraries, women as primary audience. There was one more thing that I wanted to work. Oh yes, right. Now, in terms of making the Gothic respectable, it does operate according to a particular mid-18th-century uh, aesthetic theory. So, <clears throat> Edmund Burke who you're going to be reading for next time on a different subject. Wrote a book in 1757 called An Enquiry No, that's not right. The full title is a philosophical treatise on the nature of the sublime and the sublime and beautiful. This may not be the full correct title, um, but. At any rate, it's something very long and wordy and very typically 18th century that has the word sublime and beautiful in it. Now, Burke distinguishes between the sublime and beautiful, the, the beautiful on the following grounds. So the beautiful is essentially that which excites desire. The sublime is that which inspires awe or fear. So the sublime works to inspire fear, but it does so in very specific ways, right? Um, have any of you ever kind of stood out in a flat field at night and just kind of looked up into a clear night sky and seen stars stretching out everywhere? How do you feel in relation to the rest of the universe when you do that? Tiny. Yeah, tiny and insignificant, right? 
you can think also about like the, uh, I don't know if, if, if any of you have ever seen um, pictures of um, the statues of Ramesses II on um, like the, the border, the old Egyptian border with Nubia. Um, these massive colossal statues with an impassive face, you know, they're miles high. And the whole idea is to project the power of the monarch, right? By making you feel tiny next to it, next to him. And the sublime is that which inspires awe or fear by making you feel tiny or powerless. Right? This can be a beautiful natural object, or like, you know, a, you know a, not a beautiful, but a uh, because I'm then using the terminology incorrectly. But you know, like a massive, inspiring natural object, or right? a huge mountain, a roaring waterfall, right? Or it can be something man-made like the statues that I was talking about. But the Gothic largely operates on this principle, right? You excite terror by using devices that make the reader feel insignificant, small, or powerless, right? That is how you make them afraid. And then if you're writing a terror novel, you wrap it all up neatly at the end. If you're writing a horror novel, you twist the knife in deeper at the end. OK, so does anybody have any questions about this stuff? Do you have a better sense now of what's going on in these texts and where this is all coming from? Okay, so um, we'll stop there then. I have some guide questions for you uh, to prepare you for next time, so uh, you can copy those down. And while you're doing that, I'll give everybody a, uh, give everybody a rag, a few wipe down your workstations, and we'll see you on Wednesday.